Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the latest in our What Physicians Need to Know series about COVID-19 and other important issues in healthcare. I'm Dr. Susan Bailey, president of the American Medical Association, and the purpose of today's webinar is to help you gain a better understanding of the vaccine review process and the path ahead. Our previous webinars featured representatives from the Food and Drug Administration and the CDC to explore aspects of COVID-19 vaccine development, allocation, and distribution. If you weren't able to join us for those sessions, I encourage you to watch replays of the videos, which are available for free on our website. You can find them at ama-assn.org backslash COVID-19 webinars, or you can simply visit our homepage and search for COVID-19 webinars. 10 months into our collective response to COVID-19, and the pandemic is more deadly and widespread than ever before, with record high surges occurring across the upper Midwest and really all over the country. More than a quarter of a million of our fellow citizens have been lost, including physicians, nurses, and other healthcare personnel on the front lines. Despite the surges and the heightened risks, Physicians and care providers continue to work tirelessly in hospitals and ICUs around the country. They are truly the heroes of this moment. And so are the scientists and researchers who have been working around the clock and under intense pressure to develop a safe and effective vaccine or vaccines in record time. All of us remain hopeful and encouraged by what we're hearing about vaccines in the late trial stages, but we're not quite there yet we must remain focused and continue to encourage our patients to do their part in limiting the spread of this virus. That means continuing to wear masks, washing our hands frequently, physically distancing as much as possible. With two prominent vaccines now under review by the FDA, we asked Dr. Peter Marks back to talk to us about the review process and answer questions you may have. Dr. Marks, whom we featured in our initial webinar back in October, is director of the Food and Drug Administration Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. He's board certified in internal medicine, hematology, and medical oncology. He led the adult leukemia service at Yale University and served as chief clinical officer of Smilo Cancer Hospital in New Haven before joining the FDA in 2012 as the center's deputy director. In his current role as director, he and his team are tasked with ensuring that the COVID-19 vaccine that is ultimately produced is both safe and effective, and that it has gone through a rigorous evidence-based and transparent process. Today, Dr. Marks will talk about the process the FDA is going through to get these vaccines authorized. And we hope this information not only provides you with a greater understanding of the steps the FDA is taking to ensure safety and efficacy, but also gives you the information you need to assure your patients about the reliability of the vaccines once they're authorized or approved. We also hope that you can understand that Dr. Marks might not be able to talk about any specific vaccines that are now under review as FDA officials are limited in what they can discuss while in the middle of the review process. However, he can explain the rigorous process underway and what steps lie ahead. And we're planning for additional webinar events with FDA once we have authorized vaccines so that we can go more in depth on the specifics of each one. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Marks. Thanks very much, Dr. Bailey. Let me try to get up my uh, slides here. Okay, thanks very much. So what I'm gonna do is I'll, I'll try to spend the first 20 or so minutes here just taking you through some basic aspects um, of our vaccine review process here, particularly focusing on uh, the process that will culminate in emergency use authorization, because that is what is probably most relevant uh, for the first few vaccines that we're going to see. Um, so FDA's role in uh, vaccine development is quite wide ranging. We've been regulating vaccines back since 1903, um, uh, following uh, the passage of the Biologics Control Act of 1902, uh, and actually, uh, a, a vaccine was one of the first two biologics ever licensed. That was smallpox vaccine. So um, we've been doing this for a while. And actually, 
um, uh, the, uh, the agency uh, actually was part of National Institutes of Health up through 1972. So we've done so with a research bent an applied scientific research bent to understand the basic aspects of these uh, and the basic nature of the products that we regulate. So we not only deal with the evaluation of safety effectiveness, making regulatory policy, but we also do a variety of other things for vaccines, such as we're involved in strain selection, reference standard production. We are involved with lot release, which is making sure that um, when the vaccine is finished being produced, it is what it says it is. It's got the correct identity and the correct potency. Um, and we're also involved in making sure that after uh, the vaccine is given to people in large numbers, uh, that we make sure that it continues to be safe, our post-marketing surveillance programs. And more recently, particularly with the various user fee uh, programs that have come up, we've been tasked with helping to advance a vaccine manufacturing technologies, such as by trying to start to apply newer manufacturing technologies like continuous or semi-continuous manufacturing to vaccines. But of all of those things, what has become really clear during the past year is that all of these things um, really feed into what is most important for us, which is helping to ensure public confidence uh, in any vaccine that FDA puts uh, its imprimatur of approval on. Uh, and uh, that's because the public has so much uh, issues right now with vaccine confidence that people who might never have been considered vaccine hesitant seem to be such. And we could spend a whole webinar on whether that's due to political climate or whether that's due to um, social media um, uh, and uh, the disruption of uh, some of how we all have the same uh, narrative. But whatever the case, um, we have to do um, a, a very good job uh, making sure that people uh, can feel like they're getting the information they need um, and that we've done our job so that they feel comfortable taking these vaccines. So um, we're all aware that most of the vaccines coming up now, in fact, all of the lead candidate vaccines in the United States are targeting the spike protein or S protein. Um, uh, uh, there are some candidates in very early stages that um, uh, are looking at both spike and N proteins. And obviously outside of the United States, there are some uh, whole killed uh, virus vaccines being studied. The most advanced candidates as of December now are the two mRNA candidates that we have currently in-house uh, under consideration for emergency use authorization. Uh, that's the one from Pfizer BioNTech and one from Moderna. Uh, but there are a few other vaccines that are moving along into uh, at more advanced stages of development. Um, there is a phase three trial ongoing in the United States for a chimpanzee adenoviral vector vaccine by AstraZeneca Oxford um, and an, an adenoviral 26 vector vaccine uh, by Janssen. Both of those are in phase three trials in the United States now that are enrolling. Um, and somewhat behind those, uh, are uh, protein subunit vaccines um, from Novavax and Sanofi Translate Bio, um, which are they're somewhat behind, but also moving ahead in development. And obviously this is not to slight the other 186 plus uh, vaccines that are in various stages of development, but these are the ones that um, are, are most relevant. And I think most of us on this webinar right now uh, probably are, are, are concentrating right now on the top two of these, uh, on the list, the, the two mRNA ones, because that's what we uh, see uh, closest uh, to authorization. So how did we get to a place where we're getting vaccine development in less than a year, um, when normally this is a process that takes several years? Well, traditional vaccine development is a highly de-risk activity. It's a highly de-risk activity because vaccines don't make companies a lot of money generally. Um, and so they're gonna try to reduce the costs of uh, research and development by spreading out the risk over time and only advancing from one stage to a next um, after they know that it's likely that the product is going to work. Um, and so uh, manufacturing is often 
advanced in a similar manner. And one often doesn't see scale up of manufacturing till very late in the game. Um, what that means is that one can be close to an approval and one still doesn't have lots of vaccine available for distribution. So normally you can see here kind of after first in human studies, you have the, the more definitive safety and efficacy studies and large efficacy studies and commercial scale manufacturing starts towards the very end. But what has been done um, as part of Operation Warp Speed and also um, uh, by other manufacturers that are not part of Operation Warp Speed is by collapsing some of the steps. You can't eliminate things necessarily, but what you can do is work at risk. And so the scale up of manufacturing started very early on in development, really in phase one, two, and at risk um, uh, to scale up to commercial scale manufacturing to start manufacturing millions of doses without actually knowing that the vaccine would ever be uh, given an authorization or approval. And that actually saves a significant amount of time. Additionally, eliminating dead space between phase one, two, and phase three was another thing that saved some time here. Now, obviously you can't, we, we, we can't warp time and, uh, and, and make follow-up uh, any faster than it is. So at the end of the day, when we authorize a vaccine, we're only gonna have a few months of follow-up data for safety and efficacy, but we do have the ability to do um, post-marketing surveillance and we do have the ability to follow people in clinical trials for a longer period of time. And we'll say more about that. So in order to make sure that everyone understood what the kind of ground rules for vaccine development were, we put out two guidance documents, one on kind of the general development of COVID-19 vaccines, and one that was more specific to how things would need to be done for an emergency use authorization. Because by August to October of this year, it became clearer to us that the first vaccines that would come through would indeed likely be uh, uh, granted emergency use authorization because of the incredibly pressing nature of this crisis. Um, and we'll talk more about the difference between a biologics license application and emergency use authorization and why uh, one might uh, use an emergency use authorization, even if one had a very similar data in this situation. Now, when we think about vaccine development, um, some of the things that we really have to think about is step back and realize that I'm not gonna talk a lot today about manufacturing quality. Um, uh, we as physicians often don't think a lot about that, but for biologics, that manufacturing quality is so critical. When you look at some of the catastrophes that have occurred in biologics, um, the one that led to uh, the passage of the Biologics Control Act of 1902, actually there were two of them, which were manufacturing quality issues, and um, probably the other most notable one in our history um, uh, was the Cutter incident, was also a manufacturing quality issue. We obviously spent a lot of time there because you can't even start to think about safety and efficacy until you have a quality vaccine. Biologics, you can't engineer in uh, quality after the fact. They have to be quality by design up front. Uh, we, we obviously look at our safety and efficacy. And then for these particular vaccines, post-market surveillance plan are gonna be very important. So our guidance noted that particularly for these vaccines where underserved minorities are being disproportionately affected by COVID-19, we really needed to encourage clinical trial sponsors to enroll minority populations, older populations, populations that are traditionally underrepresented in clinical trials. Um, and although we can't mandate uh, we, that they do this, we can't, you know, we don't have a, a regulation that says you must, um, we do have a bully pulpit. And that bully pulpit has been relatively effective um, uh, because the trials have enrolled a good cross section. Uh, of individuals, including um, a, a good number of older individuals. So our, the, the trial populations we, we wanted to make sure about uh, were obviously ethnic and, uh, and, and minorities and others, uh, older individuals. Ultimately, we note that we're gonna have to have data on pregnant women and pediatric populations. 
um, that obviously is going to come a little bit later um, than uh, the initial trials uh, data in adults. We also did something for these vaccines that we have not done before. Um, but you know, when you have a once in a century, hopefully pandemic, you get to do things a little differently. And that is, instead of uh, just saying, in general, we wanted efficacy of some level, uh, we, we actually put a specific number. Uh, uh, and we said that the vaccine should be at least about 50% effective. And we put a lower bound of 95% confidence interval of 30%. Why did we do that? It's because we understand that in this particular situation, there is a crisis with an opportunity cost when you uh, manufacture a vaccine and you really don't wanna put something out there that's not highly effective because we know that when people are vaccinated, they will tend to change their behavior. And you would hate to have a vaccine that paradoxically um, leads to more spread um, because people change their behavior to do less mask wearing or less social distancing. We also, as part of this guidance, put forward the fact that we wanted to see a minimum median of two months of follow-up um, for both safety and to ensure that the vaccine had some durable eff uh, effectiveness. Now, the, the issue of two-month follow-up has been uh, talked about a lot, but the, the rationale here is that most, that is about 95% of the serious adverse events with vaccines become apparent within about six weeks uh, and certainly within two months of uh, uh, the administration of the vaccine. So this at least helps us feel comfortable that when we deploy these vaccines, um, that there's anything that's in a significant way uh, in a, of a serious adverse event, we will have seen it because the trials ultimately are trials that are involving tens of thousands of individuals ranging right now from 30,000 or so for the Moderna to 44,000 for the uh, Pfizer vaccine. Um, in terms of post-licensure, we're talking about making sure that there is a robust post-licensure safety follow-up program. Uh, and that will include uh, continuing to follow uh, the clinical trial participants for up to two years um, uh, after uh, they've initially been enrolled and also having uh, both uh, a, a passive and an active safety surveillance program in place uh, once a vaccine uh, is authorized or licensed. You might say, well, why couldn't we use an immune correlate of protection? That is, why couldn't we just look at the antibodies that were made in response to these vaccines? And ra rather than using a clinical endpoint, well, there's two reasons. One is a uh, uh, is is kind of well there. Well, let's say they're both practical. One is that we don't know yet uh, whether uh, uh, the immune correlative protection and uh, the antibodies truly correlates to uh, a, a clinical prevention of disease. We hope that's the case, perhaps, but we will know once we have the data. But from a more practical purpose, it turns out that when you have the incredibly large number of cases that we're having right now, um, you get there actually faster um, with clinical endpoints, unfortunately. And we also talked about in our guidance, the ability to use the emergency use authorization uh, procedures. Now, to, to describe emergency use authorization to you, I'd like to back up and just explain what a normal biologics license application requires. Biologics are licensed in the United States under the Public Health Service Act and the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. The Public Health Service Act includes the successor to that original Biologics Control Act of 1902, um, which says that we have to have safe, pure, and potent biologics. And the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, when grafted on top of that, um, says that those also have to be uh, effective. Um, uh, and uh, this, the, the effectiveness standard that we use is that a product to be licensed has to have substantial evidence of efficacy from adequate and well-controlled trials. Um, and for vaccines, those are generally clinical trials that are randomized involving tens of thousands of individuals. And we have several different types of BLA approvals, including our traditional one. Were you able to use an immune correlative protection, you can potentially uh, get an accelerated approval. And for vaccines that we can't actually study in humans, which isn't the case for COVID-19, but is the case for smallpox, anthrax, and, and, and other bioterrorism agents, we have a way of doing an approval for a vaccine or other product 
where we use animals, uh, animal models that are validated uh, uh, to uh, look at efficacy and we use humans administration for safety. Now, emergency use authorization came about after uh, the terrorist attacks of 9-11 uh, because at that time, uh, it was, became clear that we were potentially subject to threats such as chemical, biologic, or radionuclear events where we might not have approved medical products to treat people um, who have disease, yet we might have things in development that could potentially benefit them. And in the, that kind of a public health emergency, um, once a public health emergency is declared, and there's a method for doing that in which the Secretary of Health and Human Services can declare a public health emergency, which is what we are in now, um, uh, the, these products can be used without informed consent by just providing people with information about them, even though they are investigational products. Now, the standard that's used for these emergency use authorization products for therapeutic products um, and for that matter, it would apply to any product, the minimum standard um, is that they may be effective and the known and potential benefits outweigh the known and potential risks. Obviously, there can't be an available alternative product if you're using this, because if there was an available approved alternative product, you'd use that. Now, this standard of may be effective doesn't necessarily breed the kind of confidence that people might wanna have um, uh, for a vaccine given to healthy people. And we re recognize that. It's the floor. Um, but for what we've decided is rather than be at the floor or just sitting on the floor, we need to be closer to the ceiling, more like a light fixture off the ceiling. Um, and that's why an emergency use authorization for a COVID-19 vaccine, we've articulated in our guidance that it has to have clear and compelling efficacy from a large, well-designed phase three clinical trial. It might not be exactly the same uh, as the standard we use for biologics license application, but it's going to be close. And when we bring these in, though we might not go through every last line listing of the 44,000 patients the way we would for a biologics license application, we're gonna do a fair amount of that. And we're gonna look extremely carefully at the manufacturing information, the safety data and the efficacy data and that we receive so that we feel confident uh, that what comes out of this process is the kind of vaccine that all of us would want to take in our own arms um, and have our families take. Um, we talked about doing this in a transparent manner by bringing the vaccine to a public advisory committee meeting so that providers and the general public uh, could see a discussion of the data um, that is being used uh, to come up with an authorization if an authorization is ultimately granted. And we also noted that there would have to be this enhanced post-deployment surveillance. And just to give you an idea of what this enhanced surveillance looks like, um, it turns out the government actually works pretty well with each other uh, at, at lower levels. Um, and uh, we uh, have a good collaboration uh, with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, and have worked very nicely with them to come up with what is really an interdigitating um, uh, safety surveillance program where we collaborate on uh, monitoring of uh, adverse events that are reported to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reported System, which is a passive system. People uh, fill out forms, be they patients or providers. Um, it's the traditional adverse event reporting system. Um, CDC happens to have um, an active surveillance program where they actually can get near real time information on uh, more than 12 million people through the vaccine safety data link and the clinical immunization safety assessment. And CDC also designed uh, an app uh, to be uh, used by those who elect uh, to do so, um, which will allow them to get reminders on their cell phones to report adverse events. And if certain adverse events um, are, uh, are screened out by computer, uh, they will uh, get uh, calls uh, from CDC for follow-up uh, to check on uh, them. Now, the FDA uh, will collaborate with uh, CDC um, on passive monitoring through uh, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, um, but we also have a safety system uh, which involves using a very large databases, um, uh, the Sentinel system, you may have heard of that, which is able to uh, gather data from claims-based databases 
uh, covering hundreds of millions of lives. Um, and we also have uh, our, our little unique piece of that for biologics is because it's very important to be able to take a signal and either confirm or refute it, we have uh, tens of millions of lives that we can be able to look at through uh, to the electronic health record level. Obviously, we don't get the patient's data. We get results of the queries. It's a distributed database model. Um, but this will allow us uh, to keep good surveillance for about 20 outcomes, uh, safety outcomes of interest, things like Guillain-Barre syndrome, transverse myelitis, vasculitis, things that can be seen very rarely with vaccines at a higher rate uh, than in the unvaccinated. So we want to be looking for those. Um, we want to be looking for things that could be evidence, for instance, of um, uh, enhanced uh, antibody-dependent enhancement, uh, given uh, what we know about coronaviruses, although we don't have any evidence for that yet. In terms of the Vaccine uh, and Related Biologics Product Advisory Committee meeting, uh, this is, again, something being done for transparency. Um, our committee will have a variety of external experts. Uh, their recommendations are non-binding, but we generally like to try to follow them. Uh, we have uh, experts in this case, including uh, vaccinologists, uh, several individuals with coronavirus uh, experience, um, uh, and uh, statisticians and uh, uh, both industry and patient representatives. Um, we're going to, obviously, we've committed to going to this uh, committee before any emergency use authorization is, is granted. And we're going to be doing that both on December 10th and December 11th on the 10th for the Pfizer BioNTech candidate and on the 17th, I think I might've said the wrong, I might've said 11th, then December 10th and December 17th, sorry, um, uh, to uh, discuss the Moderna candidate. Um, so two weeks in a row, um, uh, one question that will come up is how fast will we see a vaccine um, uh, authorized after that? And it will depend on the discussion at the advisory committee, uh, but we're hoping that within about a week afterwards, we'll. Uh, we'll see an authorization if everything goes well for each of those. Um, so just to finish up here, and, and I'll look forward to taking questions, you know, we've shortened vaccine timelines here without compromising vaccine safety and efficacy. That's, we cannot compromise that standard. Um, we're going to use a, an approval process or authorization process that is as transparent and open to the public as possible. Um, and we're hoping that this focus on transparency and this concern about safety and uh, effectiveness um, and our commitment to making sure that any vaccine that we authorize is going to be one that we ourselves are very comfortable taking, having our families take, and thereby having the uh, entire population take, um, that has to be really clear because we hope that we can bring back enough people into the fold for believing in this amazing thing we have of vaccines. So I look forward to answering questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Marks. That was um, that was a great, great overview. Um, we received well over 100 questions in advance of this event. Obviously, we can't address all of them, but we'll do the best that we can. Uh, many of the questions were about vaccine distribution, such as when physician offices will be able to administer vaccines to their patients. And so since the FDA is not managing the distribution portion of this, we will save those questions for another time. And as we noted earlier, uh, we won't be able to get in way down into the weeds about specific vaccines under review, but uh, we will be able to do that on our next webinars after we have authorized vaccines. So uh, speaking of getting down into the weeds, um, we had a lot of questions about uh, the nature and the safety of mRNA vaccines. Uh, are they safe? What should we know about them? Uh, do they affect our genetic makeup? Uh, help us go back to freshman biochemistry and, and understand that. Right, so these mRNA vaccines are basically using a, a snippet of genetic material to allow production of the protein and expression of these proteins for a transient period in cells. Um, and they, the, the presence of those, that protein on the surface of the cell, probably combined with some of the adjuvant effect, the irritant effect of the mRNA on the immune system seems to make a very good immune response 
to the protein. Uh, and that's why we believe we're seeing these really nice responses um, to uh, these vaccines. Now, mRNA vaccines, this is the first time we will have a widely distributed uh, mRNA vaccines, but they have been around uh, and used uh, for vaccines in clinical trials for a number of years. Uh, in previous infectious disease outbreaks, in for instance, with Zika virus and mRNA vaccine uh, was in development then. And there have been mRNA vaccines studied for influenza as well. So we do have some experience giving these to humans, albeit not to uh, this tremendously large uh, group. One of the concerns that's commonly asked about these is, is there a chance somehow that a retrovirus will get the mRNA and get it into our genome somehow? And what we can tell from everything we know from animal experiments and from previous human experience is, although it is theoretically possible, practically it hasn't been observed. Now, obviously we'll have a lot more data soon, um, but um, it's simply not, uh, it, it's not something that at this point we are, are concerned enough about to, to, to prevent us from moving forward. What, what is the half-life of the mRNA and the vaccine? How, does it, how long does it actually last in your system? Uh, you know, good question. And it's probably a matter of weeks. Okay. Okay. So not very long at all. Um, okay. Um, there were a lot of questions about, uh, and you touched on this, the use of the vaccines in pregnant women and children. Um, we know that there weren't uh, pediatric patients, you know, in these initial clinical trials um, for a number of reasons. What do you think the future of coronavirus vaccines in children will be? Are there plans to study that? Well, let me just back, that's all great. Let me just back up to one thing. Um, the, the trials, because, of the, because the definition of pediatrics in the United States and outside of the United States is slightly different, we're lucky in the United States because they, they were studied in individuals 16 and up. So we will probably um, uh, get down to the 16-year-olds. Now, <laughs> um, that's maybe not, not a lot of solace. Also, additionally, in the, um, in the Pfizer trial, there were about 50 50 children ages 12 to 17 that were, uh, were studied. They were studied in actually earlier on, but you're right, we're gonna need to study a larger contingent of, of, of children. And the way this will happen, and, and I, I know it's already been publicly announced by Moderna, and I, I suspect other manufacturers will follow suit shortly. Um, they're gonna start trials shortly where they do a typical age de-escalation, where they'll start in 12 to 15 year olds, then move to seven to 12 year olds and then down the line. And the nice thing about this, I think, will be that by the time we get to those trials, they'll be able to use immune correlates of protection. So they won't have to wait to do a large trial in lots of kids to make sure that they have uh, clinical endpoints. They'll probably just use immune correlates um, so we get an answer in a faster manner um, because obviously it will be a good thing to get these deployed in children uh, to help bring an end to this, uh, this pandemic. And the same thing goes with pregnant women. Okay. Um, pregnant women, there are a few dozen women have become pregnant during clinical trials. Excuse me, sorry. Um, a few dozen women have become pregnant during clinical trials. So we'll have data on those, but there will be additional studies that will be conducted um, during various stages of pregnancy under written informed consent. So we get more data on these vaccines in pregnancy. Great, thank you. Um, lots of questions about um, talking to patients about um, the vaccines. Um, how can we best address the safety of these vaccines that have been um, author under the EUA authorization process? Um, you know, patients know that this has gone really rapidly. You know, I have some patients that are skeptical of this vaccine, you know, given the fast that everything has proceeded so quickly. Uh, what's the best way to uh, discuss this with patients? Well, I think obviously um, there's no one right way, but for my way of, of thinking about this, we do have the fact that these were very large trial programs. And even though um, the trial follow-up, we might have a median of, of two months of follow-up on 
44,000, or well, it's actually 38,000 patients or so in one of them. And it, they're, they're, you'll, you'll, you know, this will be, um, we'll have a, a median follow-up of a certain number of tens of thousands of patients. Um, it means some of those patients will have been followed for a longer period of time, right? Because some, of the, some will be followed for four uh, or five months because these trials began uh, in, in late July. And given their size, that means we'll have several thousand individuals um, that will have been followed for that longer period of time. Now that's not totally reassuring perhaps, but when you think about it for many vaccines that we approve, we don't have these very large trials, quite as large. And so I think I would reassure patients that, you know, these, the trials, although they were done uh, in a kind of compressed manner, um, they were done in a way that's giving us much of the same data that we would have for the kind of vaccines that we get every day. Um, and uh, that the safety and efficacy has been very well vetted. Um, and that there's also going to be continued monitoring going on and that the public will be informed if there are any concerns, but make no mistake about it. We would not let any of these out of uh, the FDA um, uh, if we really had any concern that there was any hint that was gonna be of concern uh, to patients. And you know, unfortunately, there's a cost to this of being careful, right? And there's the cost right now that um, another regulator happens to have uh, made this vaccine available sooner than we did, uh, or we will. Um, and that's because we're really taking care to make sure that when people get this vaccine, we will have really vetted it for safety. Uh, and uh, if there is something there, uh, we'll know about it um, and we'll know what we're looking at so we can have a conversation about it. So um, due care is being taken. And I think, you know, uh, this is a balance. We're getting there as fast as we can because we understand people are losing their lives to this virus, but we also understand that the only way that we're gonna save more lives is if we can get a large fraction of the population to take the vaccine. When we uh, met earlier this fall, um, we talked a little bit about the Reagan Udall Foundation and um, its role with the FDA in doing um, vaccine public education. Are there plans to roll out a public education plan along with uh, approval of the vaccines? Yeah, the, the Centers for Disease Control deals with that more than we do, but we will probably take part in that as well. And I can just tell you some late breaking news, which is very relevant to providers listening. It's you who people will believe more uh, than anyone else uh, about taking a vaccine. You know, they're, they're gonna be looking to say, if you say that you're comfortable taking the vaccine, they're gonna be willing to take the vaccine. FDA, we're down, we're down a little bit. I was actually impressed. We weren't, I was worried we would be in the basement. We weren't in the basement. We were actually not too far down from, from, from providers, but it really is head and shoulders. Providers, head and shoulders above the rest uh, really are trusted. Um, and to the extent that we can help educate and that you're learning about these and that you have questions, we wanna answer them because if you're comfortable with these vaccines, that's gonna rub off on your patients. That, that's gonna rub off more. As, as a leukemia doctor, we, you go through these long conversations often about different chemotherapy options and this and that. And you, know, you could see people's eyes were glazing over. And at the end, they'd ask you the key question. So doc, what would you do? Would you take this one if it were you or would you give it to your family? And that's the place where we need to get providers to the sense of comfort that they would answer yes to that. There is nothing like that one-on-one -on -one relationship between a patient and a physician. So I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. Um, looking longer term, how are we going to learn how long these vaccines are effective? Uh, we get lots of questions like, well, how often am I gonna have to take one every year, or every five years, is you know once enough? Do, how are we gonna find that out? We're gonna find that out through several ways. The first is that they, people who are enrolled in the clinical trials will be followed. Most of them are following people for two years and they will be checking on their immunity during that time uh, because we can measure, now that we are getting a sense of what the immune correlates uh, of protection are, we'll be able to monitor those over time. So we'll see how people are doing over time. 
um, we'll also have our larger surveillance of the population of vaccinated individuals to see um, if we're starting to get breakthrough infections. So those two things will really help us. Um, uh, that is the part. I mean, there's no denying that we don't, we, that's not something that we can tell people how long they'll benefit from this. But I would say the following, you know, we know that it, we're gonna get at least months of protection out of this. And it's the months of protection that will help us all climb out of this uh, COVID-19 crisis. One question that uh, I've gotten personally from patients and we got questions uh, from um, our listeners, um, should someone who's had COVID-19 uh, get the vaccine? That is a discussion to have with your physician. I, I think it's gonna be really uh, a really interesting one. Um, it would potentially depend on your risk group and would uh, also depend on the severity of COVID-19 that you've had. I and mean, now I'm speaking more as a physician than as, uh, as an FDA official, um, because there is gonna be a little bit of, uh, of, of um, art to this. Um, the good news is the way the vaccines were studied we all, they, even though there were people enrolled um, at independent, we, they, when they were enrolled into the trials, even though they were tested at the beginning to find out whether they had had COVID-19, they were randomized without knowledge of whether they had COVID-19 or not. So people were vaccinated who had had COVID-19. So at least we do not believe from looking at um, the clinical trial data that there is any adverse effect of being vaccinated if you've had COVID-19. But the question will be, if you've had a severe case of COVID-19 recently, which tends to produce very good antibody levels, should you also get vaccinated? It doesn't really help you a whole lot. And I think that's gonna be a provider decision um, more than one that we may have a recommendation from, uh, from FDA um, that might come from CDC, we'll see. Okay. Um, as far as the uh, EUA process, um, got a, the Pfizer vaccine will be looked at by the uh, advisory committee on the 10th, um, the Moderna vaccine on the 17th. Uh, my understanding is that um, a minimum of two days prior to the meeting that the data will be made available for, for public view. We discussed that last time that that we would be able to have access to all of the data that the FDA has access to. Well, it'll be all of the, it'll be access to the company briefing book, um, uh, which is, which I, I can tell you, they'll, their companies put together pretty extensive information on, on, the, uh, on the vaccine, enough that I think most providers, enough that, that it will be, be plenty of a good read for most providers. Um, and uh, we'll put together a briefing book from FDA. Uh, people won't have access at that time to the primary data. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's tens of thousands of pages of data and it includes um, protected health information. So we, we can't make that available. Um, but um, the summary, uh, the, 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 the company documents will contain many summary tables um, uh, that will be of interest. And I think the ones, at least, I'm, I'm pretty sure they'll satisfy uh, most providers curiosity for the major endpoints. Assuming that, um, that these meetings go well and we get um, authorization for these first two vaccines, uh, what does the timeline look like going forward into January, February for some of the other vaccines that are currently in phase three trials? Yeah, it, it's very hard to tell you where, what's okay. gonna happen there. What, what, the, the, what, I can, what I can just give you is a general outlook. The trials are enrolling reasonably quickly. Um, it's, it's public knowledge. Actually, they, they've been making public the, 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 the number of people enrolled in these trials. And, and so they're, they're, they're enrolling reasonably quickly. Um, will they enroll, finish enrollment? They may finish enrollment by, by, for at least for the two large phase three trials that are ongoing right now in the United States. They may reach their enrollment goals um, before the end of the year. Um, uh, or by, by January. And then it's given the number of endpoints we've been seeing, um, it may not take that long to have a, a readout after that. So I can't tell you exactly when, um, but um, you know, the, 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 the fact that we have so many cases of COVID-19 right now 
it, it is, it's, it's so unfortunate for us as a country. Um, and the only upside to, her, to it is that when you're doing a clinical trial with an endpoint that's a clinical infectious disease endpoint, it's, um, it's, been, it's been easy to get to those endpoints because there are just so many cases. Assuming that we have a multitude of vaccines to choose from next summer, a year from now, um, how will we choose? Will patients get to choose which vaccine they have? Will that be their physician's choice? Um, it's a luxury to think about, but um, how do you think that'll turn out? Yeah, well, it's a really good question. Um, it may be that the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices may make some recommendations. Okay. Um, there, it may turn out that by looking at the different characteristics of the vaccines, there might be some that are more effective in one population than the other, um, uh, uh, and uh, some that have lower side effects initially. Um, you know, uh, it may be that, for instance, uh, I'm just making up a hypothetical um, that. Um, you know, the, the mRNA vaccines are associated with, um, uh, there are, there are uh, a, a not infrequent development of mild side effects such as fatigue, um, uh, you know, achiness uh, or low grade fever uh, for a day or two after administration. It may be that in children, if you had a vaccine, the hy completely hypothetically, if you had a vaccine that had uh, similar or somewhat lower efficacy, but had um, fewer side effects, um, you might decide that that was uh, more uh, reasonable to use there because children just, it's the same, it's the same reason why people never like the old whole, uh, whole cell pertussis vaccine. You don't like unhappy children. Um, but that, that would probably be the types of things we'd, we'd look at. It is a high bar though that we're going to be dealing with because it's, it's a matter of, it's, again, it's not, now I'm not giving you any stock tips, it's a matter that the, the, as Pfizer released in their press release and as Moderna did, they had 95% effectiveness across a wide range of individuals. So we're lucky that these first vaccines out of the gate, if everything checks out on our review, seem to be very good vaccines. Um, looking at um, the, the patients in the trials, those that um, got the placebo, um, at what point in time will they be unblinded? And um, if they do choose to get an uh, active ingredient vaccine, how's that going to affect the long-term um, safety monitoring? It's a great question. And I'm not gonna be able to give you a definitive answer today because I think the advisory committee may discuss this some more, but the way things have been heading um, has been towards the idea of either allowing participants in the trial to ask after a certain date whether they received uh, active or placebo or just to tell all the placebo patients that they received placebo and then give them the option of, uh, of switching over at the time that would be appropriate for their risk group. Because what would happen then naturally is the older individuals would get vaccinated, you know, with their in, a little earlier on with their risk group, and we then have some more follow-up time um, as younger, healthier individuals got vaccinated later on uh, by uh, a, the the couple of months probably um, with their risk group. But that's just tentative right now. So that's I'm just giving you. Um, it's like we say in guidance. That's the current thinking, but it could change after our advisory committee meeting. <laughs> understand. Um, the, the Pfizer vaccine was approved for use in the UK yesterday. Um, and we discussed last time about um, the FDA uh, reviewing international data. Um, will any of that data uh, be used to inform the uh, EUA process um, on December 10th when the, the committee meets or after that? Yeah. The Pfizer, the Pfizer, the Pfizer vaccine data that was used by the UK is the same data that we'll be using. Um, and it's just a matter of, of differences in how regulators review, um, review products. Um, we, we take, uh, and, and I, I can't speak to the political or uh, the, the regulatory status of the United Kingdom um, and their, how they came to their decision, but I can speak to ours, which is that we know that we're moving you know, our folks, um, they, they 
feel the responsibility to move as fast as they possibly can. They were eating turkey sandwiches on Thanksgiving while they were reviewing <laughs> documents, okay? People were moving as fast as they can, but they know that we in the United States have a unique position, which is that among all global regulators, we are the ones that actually don't just look at the company's tables. We actually get down and dirty and we look at the actual adverse event reports, um, the bad spelling errors that are made by physicians um, sometimes, um, et cetera. We look, we, we, look, we, we catch those, um, the copy paste errors that are made. Um, uh, we look down at those data. We look at the actual line listings submitted um, and by the way, nobody has to feel like I'm, I'm, I'm not being judgmental because I made enough of those copy paste errors in my day. So I'm not gonna cast anyone. <laughs> so just so you know, but what I'm saying here is that we do a dive here so that at the end of the day, we're gonna feel really confident that this, we have been known globally as kind of the gold standard regulator. And I can tell you that other regulators trust us because even today I've answered I can't tell you from whom, but other global regulators, I've answered emails from three other continents already today, uh, wanting to know what we're doing because people trust us because they know we're gonna do a good job. Um, they're gonna know we're gonna do, you know, the, 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 the FDA approval is a stamp that is gonna be one where when we say that we're comfortable with it, people should be able to trust this. That's wonderful. Um, at what point do we go from the EUA process for approving COVID-19 vaccines to the, the typical biologic license process? Great question, Dr. Paley. So we've already made it clear to all of the sponsors that if they submit an EUA, they have to be ready to then get on with submitting a biologics license application in the not too distant future. So we would expect that within a few months, um, once things calm down <laughs> with their, you know, getting their vaccine out, we will receive um, their biologics license application or have it completed. In some cases, they've already started what's called a rolling submission where they've already submitted parts of that biologics license application and they will simply complete that um, in the next few months. And then once that's completed, um, there will be a period where we will then review that completed version and then um, issue a license. Okay, so it's not an either or type situation. It's a one first and then following first, with the, the more the, complete. The, the okay. EUA here, you know, if, if, if one had a magic wand, um, the company would have used their magic wand and overnight created a biologics license application and um, we would have had, and, and if we had some magic wand for reviewing, we would have, you know, been able to go poof and have a, 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 a BLA review. That's the nature of the data that's being contained in these. The data, the, the clinical trials, again, that's an important thing to stress with patients. The clinical trials, because I'm getting a lot of writing campaigns right now, like these are untested, blah, blah, blah. No, these are very well tested. 30,000, 40,000 people randomized trials. That means 15 to 22,000 people getting these vaccines. That's, that's, that's a good size trial. That's, uh, that's actually above the median for the size of trial programs for vaccines that we receive at FDA for prophylactic vaccines. If you look at some of the previous vaccines like HPV vaccine or Pneumavax, those are the kinds of uh, size trial programs that we're looking at. Right. Um, well, we've um, pretty much covered all of the questions. Um, I, of course, we could go on and on. This is such an interesting discussion. But, um, but Dr. Marks, I want to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, um, this is just such a critical discussion. Um, I am, it's just amazing how quickly um, everything has progressed and um, the prospect of, you know, especially health frontline healthcare providers and those in long-term care facilities as has been recommended by the ACIP, um, having actually starting the immunization process by the time the holidays roll around is just, just gives me goosebumps. It's just absolutely miraculous. And we have additional webinars 
course in the works. So we will, of course, keep you apprised of future dates, topics, and events. We so appreciate your participation, and we'll see you again soon. Stay safe. Stay safe.